morning, everyone. We will give folks the uh, opportunity to chime in here. Um, everybody's coming in, so we'll be starting in a few seconds. Okay, while people are still coming in, we're going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Melinda Hutley, and I am the director of the Ohio Travel Association. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are um, bringing you John Workman, who's the chief of the business services division at the Ohio Department of Development. And our topic today is on the investing in Ohio's grants program. Uh, we've all been talking to you guys for a while about this great opportunity uh, we want to thank the governor, we want to thank the Ohio Department of Development and the General Assembly uh, for making these funds available to those who experience losses uh, due to the pandemic. But joining us today is my colleague Joe Savarese from the Ohio Hotel and Lodging Association, and I'll turn things over to him if, if you'd like to say a word, few words as well, Joe. Well, just to say thank you to you, Melinda, and the Ohio Travel Association and our partners at the Department of Development. Uh, and as you rightly said, the governor's office, lieutenant governor's office, the General Assembly, everybody who has been recognizing the impact on the travel economy uh, due to the pandemic and COVID-19, we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, this support is going to make a big difference in protecting Ohio's travel economy infrastructure. I thank the partners uh, for being willing to address our members today, and we will continue to talk about this for days to come. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So uh, we are very, very um, grateful to, to the Ohio Department of Development for agreeing to hop on this webinar. Um, it's an opportunity for us to You'll really get some of your questions answered to hear a little bit about the program. Um, please take advantage of this opportunity. You may submit any questions uh, that arise through the Q&A or the chat section, but we'll also have some time at the end uh, to field any questions that may come up. So at this point, I would like to turn things over to John Workman, Chief of Business Service Division, and take it away, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Joe, for helping put this together. I really appreciate it. Um, on behalf of Director Liddy Mihalik, my name is John Workman. I'm the Chief of the Business Services Division here at Development. Uh, really, again, just happy to be here this morning to present some information on these programs. Um, and it's also given me an opportunity to take a break from reviewing applications, uh, which uh, I am doing on a regular basis, all day and all night, to try and get through these programs. So. Um, just want to go over some of the programs. I'll talk a little bit about some of the requirements for each program, um, pick out a couple of items from the terms and conditions. And I do want to spend a decent amount of time talking about the application itself, talking about the process, uh, talking about what our process is. So you know what we're doing on the back end when we're, we're doing our work on these applications. So um, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right in. So we have four new programs that have been established. As you can see here, food and beverage grant, lodging grants, entertainment venue grants, and new small business grants. So what exactly do these mean? Uh, what, uh, what are the different targets? Some of them are, are obvious, some uh, a little bit more uh, behind the scenes. So first of all, food and beverage establishment grant. I mean, this one, you know, it, it is what it sounds like, right? Uh, $200 million total in funding has been approved uh, by the legislature for this program. We had $100 million approved last fiscal year and then $100 million additional approved as part of uh, the current biennial budget. The grants are in the amounts of 10, 20 or $30,000 or some small variation in there, uh, just kind of depending and we'll talk about that a little bit. And we're looking at loss of revenue in 2020. That's how we're measuring the grant amount for these programs. Many, many different types of businesses are eligible. Um, it includes both for-profit and nonprofit businesses. So nonprofits are eligible for this program. Um, and we have a list of eligible businesses in the terms and conditions. It is by no means meant to be all-inclusive. Generally, we're looking at businesses with a NAICS code that starts with 722, but um, there are obviously some businesses that potentially qualify for this program that might fall uh, outside of that. But 
you know, obviously bars and restaurants clearly eligible, mobile food services, so your food trucks, your snack bars, uh, coffee shops, bakeries, all types of different businesses uh, are eligible for this program. Breweries, wineries, distilleries, as long as they're offering on site um, and not just manufacturing for sale at, at commercial locations. Um, and then additionally for this program, you know, there are obviously some businesses that potentially could qualify for either the food and beverage grant or potentially the entertainment venue grant. They do a little bit of both. Uh, so for any business that earns more than 50% of its revenue on average from food or beverage sales, uh, we prefer that those folks uh, apply for this program as opposed to the entertainment venue grant program. So um, as I indicated, the award amounts for this program are based on revenue loss. So one of the keys of the application, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into it uh, a little further, is that we're going to ask you for your 2019 and your 2020 revenue numbers. And then our system is going to do a calculation to uh, basically come up with a revenue loss percentage between 2019 and 2020. The requirements of the program is that the business has to have been in existence since at least December 1st, 2019. Why December 1st, 2019? Because we had to have some sort of period to measure against when we were calculating revenue loss. So as long as you're in business for at least one month, in 2019, you will tell us that. You will tell us that when you submit your application so that our system will calculate. Basically what the system does is it calculates an average monthly revenue. So if you tell us you're only in business one month in 2019, the system knows how to do the average calculation for 19, does the same thing for 20, takes your total revenue, divides it by 12, calculates that monthly avenue, average revenue, and that's how we calculate the revenue reduction percentage. So anything between 10 and 30% is a $10,000 grant. Um, and one other thing I will point out, if your revenue loss uh, percentage is 9.5%, we are rounding that up to 10. So we are following standard rounding rules that everybody learned in math class that 0.5 goes up to the next number and anything below that goes down. So we are rounding. You don't have to be exactly 10%. If you're 9.5 or higher, you will qualify. Uh, so between 10 and 30% is a $10,000 grant. 30 and 50% is a $20,000 grant, and then anything in excess of 51% is a $30,000 grant. Additionally, the awards are capped at your actual amount of loss. So very simple example, if you have a business that uh, earned $10,000 in 2019, earned $4,000 in 2020, that's more than a 50% loss. Technically, they would be required or, or entitled to a $30,000 grant, but because they only lost $6,000, we're capping their grant amount at the amount that they actually lost. So. Um, Again, trying to make sure the businesses are made whole, but not enrich them beyond uh, where they were at in 2019. Um, we do have some funds set aside for each county across the state of Ohio. So we've set aside $500,000 in funds for all of Ohio's 88 counties, and we're setting those funds aside until July 31st. So that deadline is coming up quickly. Um, I will tell you that in practicality, um, we I don't believe we have yet quite $100 million in applications for this program. So you can see that we have a lot of funding available. Now we had a pretty, pretty big rush of applications on the first two days, and then it's kind of slowed down a little bit since then. We've received a couple hundred per day since then. Um, so on the, the availability of funding side, we have a lot of funds available. Um, I don't anticipate we're going to run out of funding anytime soon. So even though we're setting aside money for businesses in all of Ohio's 88 counties, we're at this point, we're able to fund everybody who submits an application. And again, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So um, the county allocations, we did it, but they're really only effective if you have applications in excess of the amount that you have to award. Uh, because we are still well under that amount that we have to award, the county allocations are still there, but they don't have the same effect because we're basically awarding anybody who comes in and submits an application. And at this time, we are not um, planning to extend those deadlines again, just because we don't have enough applications yet to utilize the full amount of funding that we've received. So the next program I'll talk about briefly is the lodging grant. Um, it's all of these programs are going to be very, very similar, and there's just a, a small difference between each of them. So for this program, we have $50 million in funding. Uh, again, it was $25 million last fiscal year and another $25 million as part of the budget. Very similar to uh, food and beverage. The grants are $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, depending on the decline in occupancy rate in 2020. So that's really one distinction here for the lodging grant, is that we're looking at decline in occupancy rates as opposed to decline in revenue. Decline in revenue is what we focus on for the food and beverage grant, as you saw, and then as you will see shortly, the entertainment venue grant as well. Eligible businesses for this one are real simple. Hotels, motels, bed and breakfast operations. And one of the keys of this program is that you are required to have a license from the Ohio Department of Commerce as a hotel motel. So that is one of the required attachments. I'll talk a little bit more about the attachments when I get to the application, but lodging grant again, for-profit, not-for-profit, both are eligible must be able to show a 10% occupancy reduction between 19 and 20, must have a copy of uh, a hotel motel license issued by the Department of Commerce. Otherwise, the programs are very, very similar. 
The application process is very, very similar. And again, we'll walk through that here in just a couple minutes. One second, let me get the slides to move. There we go. Okay, got it. I'm not the most technologically savvy person there's ever been. So the next program that we're administering is the Entertainment Venue Grant. So 40 million in funding for this program. Again, this one is, is very, very similar to food and beverage. It's almost the exact same review than food and beverage. So 10, 20, 10, 20 and $30,000 grants for this program. What are we looking for? Again, we have a list on the terms and conditions. It is not all inclusive, but the types of businesses that we're looking at movie theaters, music venues, sports venues, museums, family fun centers, the full list is in the terms and conditions. But if your business is not in the terms and conditions and you think you might be eligible, either submit an application and we'll review it, or you're always free to reach out to the email address at the bottom of the, the, the slide here, entertainmentvenuegrant.development.ohio.gov. Um, and I think I failed to mention, but we do have email addresses for each of the four programs that are independent. Uh, so you see for food and beverage, for lodging grant, for entertainment venue grant, these are all up on the website, businesshelp.ohio.gov. Uh, I'll point you to that a couple times as we talk. My staff are manning those email inboxes and responding to folks as soon as they submit an email. So usually within a couple of hours, you'll get a response from my team. Uh, it might take up to a day or two, but the email inbox uh, hasn't been huge volume. So we've really focused on customer services time and trying to get back to folks having conversations about the applications and how they work. The final program that we're running is I would say different from the other three programs and more similar to what we did at the end of last year when we did the small business relief grant. Um, this program is geared towards businesses that opened in calendar year 2020. And the grants are a flat $10,000, very similar to what they were for the new small business grant that we did at the end of last year. What are the requirements for this program? Very similar to the small business relief grant, you are required to have had W-2 employees as of January 1st, 2021. So that's the biggest thing that we're reviewing. Um, there are a number of different types of documents that are eligible to be submitted that can be seen in the terms and conditions. Um, and then otherwise, you're required to have established your business in calendar year 2020. And there's a number of different ways we allow you to prove that as well. Um, opening up a business banking account, hiring your first employee, registering with the Secretary of State. So there's a number of different documents that can be used to prove that as well. So um, again, new business grant at development.ohio.gov. My staff who is currently reviewing the applications is also uh, keeping an eye on the inbox, answering any questions as they come in. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to my staff. Um, they are there and waiting to assist. So let's talk a little bit about the application process. Businesshelp.ohio.gov, that's the website that everybody needs to go to. That's where the link to the application for all of these programs is located. You will also find three important documents for each program, terms and conditions. That's the big one. If you're going to apply for the program, I recommend you read through the terms and conditions. It's only about six or seven pages, it's a pretty easy read. Um, it just explains to you exactly what we are looking for in these applications that we are receiving. Fact sheets, these are good overviews of the program. So if you're trying to share information about the program with somebody or with a group, send them the fact sheets uh, and that will give them a good overview of how the programs and how they work. FAQs, these are some of the questions that we've gotten in, some of the things we learned from last time we did a program similar to this. Uh, so that uh, is up there as well. If you have any questions, some of them have already been answered. And then again, I talked about the email links, four separate email links for all four of the programs. So depending on which one you're going to be applying for, email that link directly. Uh, and my staff will be there waiting for you to ask them questions and we'll be willing to provide answers. And then you will also find obviously the button to the application uh, on that website under each of the different four programs. So what do you need to do to apply? The first thing that you need to do is if you don't already have one, you need to have an OHID. OHID is basically a, a login information that allows you to gain access to a number of different state systems, including, for instance, filing tax returns, uh, filing reports with the Department of Commerce, all kinds of things. So many businesses already have an OHID across the state because they use it to conduct their, their everyday business. Um, you can use the exact same OHID. You do not have to create a new OHID to be able to access this application, but you do need to have one. So um, what we're recommending for folks is if you don't have an OHID, go to ohid.ohio.gov, create that OHID first, then come back to businesshelp.ohio.gov because if you click the application link through our website, businesshelp.ohio.gov, it will take you exactly where you want to go to the application. You can also get there through the OHID website, but it's a little bit more complicated. You have to know what you're looking for. So always recommend to folks to get to the application, go directly through businesshelp.ohio.gov. Once you log into the application, uh, there'll be three initial questions that it will ask you. 
Um, it will ask, who are you? Uh, do you have a trade name? If so, what is it? And what is your either federal employee identification number or your social security number? We do recognize that there are some businesses that will be eligible for these programs that not necessarily have a federal employer identification number. Um, while the new small business grant requires a business to have employees, none of the other three programs do. So if you have a hotel that is run by an individual who doesn't have any W-2 employees that they pay or their family runs it, whatever it might be, those folks are eligible even though they don't have W-2 employees. So food and beverage, lodging, and uh, the entertainment venue grant, there is not a W-2 employee requirement for those programs. Um, so you'll log into the application, you'll enter those three, the three pieces of information. The second screen you will go to will ask you, which program do you want to apply for? You can only apply for one program per FDIN, so, or social security number, whatever it might be. So you'll have a radio button and you'll get to choose which four of the programs you wanna apply for. There's a short description of each of the programs on that page as well, um, but that basically gives you uh, everything that you need to be able to pick which program you're applying for. The first tab of the application is going to look exactly the same regardless of which program you are applying for. And it's really, really straightforward and it's really, really easy to complete and it doesn't take very much time. The name, FEIN, social security number, whatever it is that you entered on that first tab are going to pre-populate onto this next tab when you open it up. So you don't even have to enter that information. We've carried it over from the first, first piece that you put in. What else are we going to ask for? We're going to ask for your NAICS code. We're gonna ask for ownership demographic information, and there is an option for prefer not to answer. You don't have to provide that information if you don't want to. We're gonna ask you what type of business are you? Are you a corporation, LLC, partnership, joint venture, sole proprietor, nonprofit, whatever that may be. We're gonna ask you what calendar your business was established. Um, we're gonna ask you whether or not you receive funding from other grant programs, and we don't care. It has no effect on the eligibility for your application whatsoever. It's purely statistical. We just wanna know, you know, have a businesses in Ohio receive funding from other programs, and if so, how much? We're just using that for statistical analysis, nothing else. And then the only other item on the first page that you will provide us is who's the contact person for this application? And I would just say, make sure that the email address that you enter in on that contact information is 100% correct, because we communicate for these programs 100% via email. So if your application is approved, if your application is rejected, You'll receive a confirmation once you submit it. All of that is going to go to the email address that you enter on that first page, so make sure that's correct. The second page of the application is, is where it's gonna look a little bit different depending on which program you apply for. So I'll go through uh, each one individually briefly uh, and talk about exactly what we're gonna be looking for. So for the food and beverage grant program, pretty simple. Um, the, the eligibility for all of these programs is location specific. So when you get to that second tab, that's the first place we're gonna ask you what location are you applying for? And when you do that, make sure you're giving us the physical location of the business. So you might have, for example, a headquarters or an office space that you maintain, but your actual operating entity, the one that you're applying for is at a different location. Make sure you're entering that operating location, not your headquarters location or your office location. So that's the first thing we're gonna ask you for is where is the business that you're applying for? And we do have address verification software behind the scenes working to make sure that we're getting valid addresses. If you have any issues with that software whatsoever, because the USPS is not always perfect and that's where we get our database, reach out to us via the email inbox, let us know. We have a way to override it on the back end in our system, but you can't do it on the front end. So if you have somebody applying that's having issues with the address verification, please just have them reach out, fill out as much of the application as they can, and then we'll get that corrected for them. Um, so for this program and for the entertainment venue grant program, because they're basically identical, um, you fill out the, the, the address of the location, and then you give us two numbers, uh, three numbers potentially. How many months were you in business in 2019? So that we can make sure we're doing the monthly calculation correct. So for most businesses, it'll be 12. What is your 2019 gross receipts and 2020 gross receipts? Again, we're talking about basically what you rang up at your cash register, right? Don't take out any of your costs, anything like that. If you were filing a, a partnership return, it's at line one, gross receipts or sales. That's what we're looking for. Tell us exactly how much you sold. Um, not necessarily, you know, don't take out your costs. Don't calculate profit. Just tell us how much you rung up at the cash register. Um, you tell us that for both years. Our system is going to go behind the scenes. It's going to do the entire calculation. So it's not even my folks doing the calculation. It's just all mathematics behind the scene. That will calculate whether or not the applicant is entitled to award, and if so, how much that award should be. The most important part of all of these applications is the three required attachments. And there are three required attachments for every program. They're a little bit different for each program, so I'll go through them individually. But when my folks are reviewing these applications, when I'm reviewing these applications, um, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at your application fields just to make sure everything makes sense, passes the smell test, uh, but really our entire evaluation of eligibility comes down to these three attachments and whether or not they meet the requirements of the terms and conditions. So the first thing is, 
you just told me what your 2019 revenue was and your 2020 revenue was, so prove it. Uh, so we have a couple of different documents that we accept uh, for you to be able to prove that. Obviously tax returns, um, if they're on a calendar year, remember we do need calendar year numbers. So if you're a fiscal year file or a tax return, probably not gonna work for you, but there are other options. We also accept uh, financial statements. Again, those would have to be on a calendar year basis. Uh, so if you're fiscal, again, that might not work for you or we allow internal accounting records. So we know there are a lot of you know micro businesses across the state that are still using Excel or QuickBooks or whatever it might be to keep track of their sales and their costs and all sort of thing. That's perfectly fine. Um, you know, Obviously we're not gonna put those businesses at a disadvantage because they don't use advanced accounting software or have an accountant that files things on their behalf. So there are a couple of different ways that you can provide that documentation. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different options there. The second piece, um, and this is going to be so these attachments are going to be exactly the same for food and beverage and entertainment venue. So these two will be almost identical. Um, the second piece is basically just prove to us that you're still in operations, prove to us that you've incurred business costs in the last 60 days. And this is really a protection for us, obviously, right? We want to make sure we're not giving out grant funds to businesses that are no longer open, that are no longer operating. So show us that you've paid your employees in the last six days, show us that you've bought supplies, show us that you've paid for utilities, you've made a mortgage or a rent payment, anything like that. So there's a number of different documents that are eligible for this. Again, it's really just our comfort to say, yes, we're giving this money to a business that is actually still here and it's still operating. And then the final attachment for the food and beverage and the entertainment venue grant programs would be a copy of a license. Uh, and there are three different license types that are eligible. A vendor's license, a food service operations license, or uh, a liquor license. Now, there is also somewhat of a caveat to that as well. Very early on in the process, we learned from some of our nonprofits that um, would otherwise qualify for the entertainment venue grant or the food and uh, beverage grant, that they were not required to obtain it any of those three licenses for whatever reason. So we made this change to the application very quickly early on. Uh, very proud of my IT staff and my team. We are responding to folks quickly. We're adapting quickly. When we find out things that we need to change, we change them quickly and we try to change them on the fly. And this was an example of that. We learned that nonprofits weren't required to have one of these licenses, but otherwise would be eligible for the program. So if you click nonprofit on the first page as your business type, the second page will allow you to submit a copy of your Secretary of State registration as your license. Now, again, that's going to have to show that you're a nonprofit, verify that status, that sort of thing. But um, again, that's just an example of how very early on we realized, okay, this doesn't work for this subset of applicants. How can we fix it? We allow them to submit something else other than those three types of licenses that we would otherwise require. So jumping to uh, the lodging grant. Um, so it's very similar to the other two, just with a small tweak. So. Um, when you get to the second tab of the application, again, you're going to enter a project location very similar to what you did uh, for the other application. Um, and then you're going to enter a couple of different numbers. You're going to enter your revenue numbers for both 19 and 20. Uh, that's basically more just for our information at that point. And then you're also going to enter your occupancy numbers for 19 and 20. So as they discussed about the um, eligibility requirements, that's where we're going to do our evaluation. So attachment one, verify those occupancy rates that you, that you showed us. Um, I have actually been reviewing the lodging grant applications myself, so I'm getting very used to the, the very similar types of reports I'm seeing from all the applicants, and I kind of know where to look now to pick up those occupancy rates. So it took me a while to get the hang of those reports, but now I've, I've kind of got it down. I know exactly where to look, so that, that has made it easy. Um, very similar, prove to us that you've been in, in operations in the last 60 days, something showing that you've incurred some business costs. And then the final attachment is a license, but it's a different license. It's the hotel motel license issued by the Ohio Department of Commerce. Um, something I forgot to mention. So as I previously indicated, it is one application per FEIN. So you might've thought, well, what if I have multiple locations under the same FEIN? The application allows for that. So on the second tab, when you enter the, uh, the uh, address of the project location, you attach documents that are specific to that location. Then if you have additional locations under the same FEIN that would also qualify, you can add them. You can add as many addresses as you would like. For example, uh, very early on, we received an application from somebody who owns Subway franchises, and they own 11 of them. They were all were able to qualify for the program independently, but they were all under the same FEIN. So he submitted his application with 11 locations. My staff reviews all 11 as they're reviewing the application. Every location does have to qualify independently, and you need to be able to show that. So, for example, we had an applicant submit three applications for three different locations, but include the same tax return for all three. Well, that doesn't necessarily work because we're not getting verification directly that each location had at least that 10% revenue loss. So we required them to uh, correct their application and resubmit. So um, we do allow for multiple locations to be on one application, but each location has to independently qualify and each location will be required to include those three attachments that we uh, require for, for all uh, programs.
program applicants. The final program that you'll see will be the new small business grant. Um, on that one, the, the second tab is pretty simple. Enter the date that your business was established in 2020 so we can verify that date. The first document will you attach will be basically matching up with that date. So if you told us you were established February 1st, 2020, provide us with a document that shows a February 1st, 2020 date that meets the requirements of the terms and conditions. And then you will also be required to show us that you're still incurring business costs. So that same thing, 60 days, um, show us that you've incurred some costs. And then the last piece for that program is employees as of January 1st of 2021. So um, again, three attachments clearly laid out in the terms and conditions. On that second page of the application, we actually have uh, the language from the terms and conditions uh, for each individual program that identifies the specific attachments that we allow. So we try and make it as clear as we possibly can. So what's the process? What are we doing on the back end? As soon as you submit your application, you should receive an email uh, with a basically an application confirmation saying, yes, we have received your application. It'll be reviewed in the order in which it was received. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're reviewing applications in the order in which we were, they were received. So. I have a team of about seven or eight individuals who are working on the new small business grant. I have a team of about seven or eight individuals that are working on the food and beverage grant. Those are our two biggest grants uh, as of right now in terms of volume of applications. Food and beverage far and away is the biggest one, uh, followed by new small business grant. And then lodging and entertainment venue are about the same. Uh, so I have been reviewing the lodging grant applications. So if you have anybody who's gotten a response on that application, uh, that's been from me. Uh, I've also been manning the email inbox over the last week and a half. So if they've emailed the inbox and gotten a response, that's been from me as well. Um, and then we'll be turning to the entertainment venue grant program probably tomorrow to start to review those. But again, uh, the volume there is not nearly as great. Uh, so we should be able to get through those pretty quickly. So again, my staff will review your application. Uh, they've been trained. They have the terms and conditions in front of them. Um, and basically they're just, they're, they're looking at the terms and conditions and saying, does this fit what we told them? Uh, it's very, very simple analysis. Is it an acceptable document type? Does the document verify information from their application if required? It's a pretty simple analysis for my team. Um, so once they, they review the application, you will hear back from us with one of two emails. The first, which is the one everybody wants to see, is that you've been approved email. Um, so if you're approved, the next step is that you are required to register as a supplier with the Ohio Office of Budget and Management. The reason that we did this is um, when we did the program at the end of last year, we issued checks only. Uh, and it kind of became a nightmare. Part of it had to do with the timing uh, when we did it. It was mid-December. And uh, if anyone's wondering, it's never a good idea to try and send 12,500 checks in the middle of December in the middle of a pandemic uh, when everybody else is also trying to put all of their mail in at the same time. So that did not go well. So um, because of that, we are encouraging folks to uh, provide electronic payment. We're requiring you to provide electronic payment information uh, so that we can direct deposit your funds. It's better for everybody. We don't have to worry about checks coming back. They don't have to get delivered. You don't have to worry about checking your mailbox every day to see if the, the, the check has actually arrived at your location, tracking down your mailman, all that kind of stuff. The money will be directly deposited into your business banking account. Now, that does take some time. Um, the, the Office of Budget and Management obviously is dealing with a, a higher volume than they're used to because of the programs that we're administering. So um, anywhere from seven to 10 days uh, to get a response from OBM to get your supplier ID number. We obviously are holding awards during that period. We know the delay. I've had a couple people reach out via email. You know, OBM says it could be seven to 10 days. Am I going to lose my money? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Once we approve you, we're holding you those funds. They aren't going to go away. So as, you know, if, the, if the supplier ID process takes five days, 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, whatever it might be, your funds are still going to be here for you. We're not going to let those go. And then if it's the first time you've become a supplier and the first time you're using your bank account, they have to go through what they call a pre-note process, um, which is basically OBM verifying that your bank account is real. So um, most of you have probably seen this type of thing if you've signed up for PayPal or Venmo or that type of thing. Sometimes they do this where you'll see like a penny pop into your account or a zero deposit pop into your account. Um, we have to do that as well to verify that the bank accounts are real. So because of that, it can sometimes be up to a 15 to 20 day process, um, you know, once you're approved to, to get your funds actually into your bank account. But we're working through it as quickly as we can. We're uh, on the phone with OBM multiple times per week trying to make sure that process flows as, as smoothly as possible. So that's the award process. Um, if your application is rejected, there are basically two different things that you can do. And first of all, we've tried to, again, one of the things that we've really focused on this time is customer service. So the first two weeks after we opened the application, we didn't review any applications. And that was, we did that on purpose because we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to respond to every single email that came into the inbox to try and help people through this application as much as possible. So we did that. And we continue to do that and we will continue to stay on the email inbox. The other thing that we're doing when we did the, the program at the end of last year, we were fairly vague about what was wrong with folks' applications. We basically just told them which attachment was wrong, but not why. 
So this time, if we're rejecting an application, we're actually putting notes in as to why. And those notes are going to come through into the email that you received from us. And we're trying to be as specific as we possibly can. So we're hoping that this does a number of things. Obviously, it's going to make it easier for the applicant to go back in and fix the problem. It's going to be easier for us because we're not going to have folks reaching out to us wondering why their application was rejected because we've given them that information. So we're trying to focus more on customer service this time around. So if your application is rejected, you have two options. One, you can go back into your application as it is uh, in a rejected status. You can make changes and you can resubmit it and then it'll go back into the queue and we will review it. The other option is if you just want to start over, you want to throw that first one away and just do a brand new fresh one, you certainly can. Log back in using the exact same login information you used the first time. You'll have the option to withdraw that application. Once you do that, the system will then allow you to go in and submit a new application. So um, there are a couple of different ways to do that if your application is rejected. Obviously, if you have any questions whatsoever about why your application was rejected, just reach out to us. Um, you know, we will certainly help you through that process. Um, if you read the terms and conditions, it indicates that you, know, you go back to the end of the line uh, if your application is rejected. Um, and we've been following that in most cases. In some cases, you know, if it's a small fix, we can potentially jump in and approve that. And again, the reason we can do that is because we are nowhere near being fully subscribed on any of these programs. So we know for 100% certainty that every single application that I have right now and a good portion of additional applications that we anticipate receiving, I will be able to fund them with the funding that I have. So, um, you know, we're, we're working with folks, we're reviewing the applications, approving them where we can. Um, again, as long as folks can work with us and make sure we have the right attachments so that we can justify why we gave folks this money. Because you have to remember that is that, you know, we're dealing with taxpayer money. We're dealing with my money, your money, everybody in the state of Ohio's money. So our biggest concern is just making sure that if somebody comes back to me tomorrow and says, why did you approve ABC company's application? I can simply open the application. I can say, here's their first attachment, matches exactly with the terms and conditions. Here's a second, the third. Everything lines up perfectly. They calculated a revenue reduction. They were eligible for the program for the terms and conditions. So that's really what my folks are doing. It's protecting us. It's protecting you. Uh, it's making sure that everybody is being held to the same standards as following the same rules. That's what's most important to us is, is being fair and making sure that we're administering this program fairly. So it may seem like sometimes we're, we're being a little harsh or we're being um, you know sticklers or being strict on the terms and conditions, but there's a reason that we're doing that. It's because we want to make sure that everybody is held to the same standards. So, um, you know, like I said, businesshelp.ohio.gov, that's the website you want to go to, has all the information about the four programs and how to apply. And then these are the four email inboxes for the four programs. They make sense, obviously. They're all on the website under each of the drop downs. They're on every page of the application as you work through the process. So um, just have folks reach out if they have any questions whatsoever. We're ready and waiting to respond to those emails as they come in. Um, and ready and waiting to continue to review applications. Um, like I said, we've got a pretty big, um, pretty big volume in the food and beverage grant program. We're working through those as quickly as we can. That's gonna be the one that's gonna take the longest. So um, lodging grant, entertainment venue grant, new small business or new business grant, those programs, you're probably gonna hear from us a little bit sooner on those ones, food and beverage. Again, depending on when you applied, if you applied right away, then you probably have already heard from us. Um, but if you waited a couple of days, if you were later in the application period, um, then, then it's probably gonna be a little bit until you hear back from us, but we're working through them as quickly as we possibly can. Um, as of right now, there are no plans to close the application. Now, we haven't discussed that yet. We're continuing to receive applications. Again, we have the county allocation deadlines coming up in a couple of days, but because of where we're at, because of where we're at on funding, we can fund you know, every application that we have and then some. So I'm not uh, too concerned about that. Um, I'm, I'm believing that those deadlines will come and go, and then we will just continue you know, operating the programs and, and funding whoever comes to the application and submits a complete application. So. I think I've I've done enough now. Um, I never love listening listening to myself talk for a half hour straight. So um, I will ask Melinda to join back in and happy to answer any questions that anyone might have about the programs. Or again, if you don't want to ask it here, feel free to reach out to one of the program inboxes or reach out through Melinda or Joe. They both have my contact information. Um, always willing to help out as much as we can to try and get folks who are eligible for these grants actually awarded and get the funds into your account. So thank you very much, Melinda. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. And Joe, I'll ask you to <clears throat> unmute and come back to us also uh, to help see if, they, if you've received any questions. Um, John, that was really thorough and I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. We do have some questions. Um, so one thing I, I, I see there's a little confusing. Yes, uh, first of all, we will send a link of the recording. Um, so uh, not only we get the recording, but you'll also get 
um, I believe the the deck with some of the links live. Kelly, is that that's what we're planning to do? Yes, that's correct. Okay, perfect. Um, so there there is a little confusion about. So there's two different. IDs, right? So when you are starting the application, you are um, required to sign up for what's called an OH ID, correct? Yes, and absolutely. So the OH ID is before you start the process. Yes. Um, and the question was, how long does it take for that to get approved? So that is actually instantaneous. That's a completely, um, it's an IT process. Nobody reviews it. Um, you just enter your information and they give you an OHID immediately. Excellent. And it's, and it's associated with your email address. So, um, you know, whatever email address you use to establish the OHID, that's what we'd use if you forgot your OHID, if you've got your password, that's what everything is linked to is whatever email address you use to create that OHID. Great. So they, you get on, you apply for the OHID, you get that instantaneously, you do your, your application, you're approved, and then you have to get a supplier ID. Correct. And so there is a question, um, just wanted, someone wanted to know a little bit more about what that is and mm -hmm. why that's that's needed. So maybe a little more explanation of that process. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, so basically a supplier ID is what is what allows the state to pay vendors. Now, obviously this is not really a vendor situation, but um, this is what we utilize the same process. So. For the state to be able to pay somebody something electronically, you have to have a supplier ID. And what you'll be providing as part of that process is obviously going to be identifying yourself and who your business is. You're going to be verifying your federal employee identification number using a W-9. So make sure you have a W-9 available. They're going to want to see that. And then you're going to provide your bank account information for your business. And again, that's so we can directly deposit your funds into your bank account. So the supplier ID process is actually pretty simple. Um, they actually automated for most applicants, the W-9 process is now automated through OBM. So you don't, previously you had to print off a you know PDF copy of a W-9, you had to upload it into the system, that kind of stuff. They have automated that part of the process. For most applicants, there are some that you still have to go through the paper process and you have to ask OBM about that. But um, otherwise the process is pretty simple. Um, Again, it's just them kind of verifying that everything matches up and then getting you a supplier ID, which again, allows us to, it's basically an accounting thing, right? We enter that in, number into our system and then when we send it over to them, because we don't actually cut the payments ourselves as an agency, um, it's budget that cuts the payments. So it's basically just an identification number for us to say, okay, budget, you pay this person in your system. So, um, and then what we're also doing, when you come back into the application after you're approved to enter your supplier ID, once you have it, we are verifying that with, with budget and management. So we have an instantaneous kind of behind the scenes, way too technological for me to understand how it works, but somehow the systems acknowledge that the, the supplier ID that you enter is matching the FEIN that is with the, with the system on the other side. So basically FEIN and supplier ID on OBM, FEIN and supplier ID in our system, they have to equal for you to be able to proceed. If there's any issues with that, reach out to my staff, we can help you work through that. Sometimes there are um, just kind of depending, you know, there's always unique circumstances that pop up. So, um, but that process also, when you receive your approval email from us, it's a fairly long email. And the reason is that because it talks a lot about the supplier ID process and how to work through that process, it gives you links gives you a phone number to OBM. They actually have people you can talk to if you have issues with it and all the, the forms and attachments you're gonna need, all that kind of stuff. So um, the approval email gives a lot more information directly about how you go through the process with the budget management office. So if they've already received funds, let's say from the Ohio Arts Council or from another government agency, would they already have a supplier ID? And is there a way to check to see if they have a supplier ID already in the system? It could potentially. It depends on whether or not that entity required them to sign up for one or whether they paid via paper check. Uh, but the easiest way to know for sure is just to uh, reach out to OBM. Uh, they have a, there's a phone number or an email address um, to get into the to, to reach out to them and ask whether or not there's a, a supplier ID. Again, very similar to our system. Everything is tied either to an FEIN or an SSN. So you'll want to give them that number when you call, ask them if there's a supplier ID associated with that. If so, then you can utilize that existing supplier ID. You do not have to get a new one. Um, but if not, you will have to go through that process. Still, yeah. Okay, so reach out to them. If you think you might have a supplier ID, that could cut some of the time um, yep. that we needed to get one. Okay, Yep, great. and I think the phone number for OBM is also in the FAQs, if I remember correctly. So it's also oh. in there, if you didn't okay. get to the approval email stage. So. Perfect. 
Thank you for that. Keep questions coming either in the chat or the Q&A. We will get to all of them. We also had some come earlier. Um, one of the questions we had earlier, it says they're new to grant writing, a little intimidated, looking for tips and, and clues. You know, my understanding is this isn't a compet this isn't a competitive grants program, so this process shouldn't be a problem. This a competitive grants program, you're trying, you are really doing the grant writing and trying to meet the right. rec criteria. This is a grant program, but it is based on revenue losses. Period. They're not, um, you know, the the criteria set. Show the revenue losses. Show you meet the eligibility. You're going to get the funds. So please don't be intimidated by this process um, because it's not the same as applying for a competitive grant. Is, is that true, John? Is that your oh, 100% on? correct. Yeah, no, you're, you're directly on point there, Melinda. And the other thing I would point folks to, and again, I know that everybody is very, very busy. You're short staffed. Um, you're wondering when you might be able to have time to get this stuff together. You know, the, the information that we're asking you to enter into the application that you're typing in, you'll know off the top of your head. You're not going to have to go digging for anything. Obviously, the piece that is going to take a little bit of time is putting together your revenue numbers or your occupancy numbers for 19 and 20. Um, but, you know, most of us have our tax returns. You know, they're in our documents. They're ready to go. So the biggest time crunch, the biggest, you know, piece of, of, of understanding for the application is those attachments. Um, you know, we're obviously willing to help via the email inboxes. We can, you know, if you want to send us your attachments, say, hey. Are these good? Would that work for the application? We're happy to do that. We have no problem with that whatsoever. We can't actually approve you until you get into an application. But the other thing I would point folks to, um, you know, our agency also administers both all of the small business development centers across the state and all the minority business assistance centers across the state. And all of those advisors are queued into these programs. They know about them. We provided them all the documentation on these programs. They understand how the system works. So again, I know that time is a crunch and you don't always have time to do this type of thing, but if you have an opportunity and you want that one-on-one -on -one assistance, those are the places that you want to go to do it because those folks can help you with getting the right documentation, submitting the application. There really are boots on the ground with respect to these programs. Well, that's a great tip. Thanks for that. Are there any restrictions as to how the funds can be used? There are some restrictions in the terms and conditions, but you know, honestly, as long as you're using the funds for business costs, you're fine. And it can be to reimburse costs that have already been incurred in the past, or it can be used for future costs to be incurred, payroll, mortgage, rent, utilities, supplies, whatever it might be. You know, it's just honestly, you know, we don't want you to use them to pay taxes. Typically, you don't want to use grant funds to pay taxes. We don't want you to use them to pay uh, for lobbying activities, political activities, that sort of thing. We don't want them want you to use them to give yourself a bonus, you know, that sort of thing. We just want you to use them on business costs. Um, you know, the, the terms and conditions talk about saving records of what you spent the funds on for, I think, five years. Um, you know, there's always the potential of an audit, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of grantees, so it, it's probably not going to happen. We trust our grantees in this circumstance. If, if you've proven eligibility for these programs, we're confident that you're a real business, that you've struggled, that you need these funds, and that you're going to use them on business costs. So that's really it. Generally, business costs either already incurred or to be incurred. That's great. And I know one of the other questions was, what about reporting? So I think that's a little intimidating. People, again, they're used to these competitive grants. They're used yeah. to having to keep all these records. They're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get into this process. My take is this isn't the same. Like the um, so, what are the requirements for reporting? I think you just answered that. Yeah, none. none. Um, yeah. There's nothing that is required now. Potentially six months down the road, do we send out a survey, a voluntary survey, to maybe to collect some information from some of the applicants for use for our statistical purposes or for analysis, that kind of stuff? Yeah, maybe, but it's nothing that's going to be required. So there's no required future reporting. You don't have to show us how you spent the money. We actually did have some folks under the previous program who I, you know, I ended up getting in the mail, like their proof of how they spent the dollars. And it's like, great, thank you. I appreciate that. Didn't need it, but you know, it's good to see that you spent the money on, on business costs. So um, yeah. as of now, no future reporting requirements. Right. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the things, one of the questions I had, so um, you said if they, let's say they started the business in 2019, but they didn't start till late in 2019. And then you're basing that year's revenue based on a one month. Is there any um, anything in your system that's accounting for the seasonality of, of the issue? Because a, a one month in December 2019 could look very different from an August right, 2019. Uh, just, just curious, I was just curious if that, if that is, uh, considered and and how you guys are going about that 
So it can be, and actually this is a really good point. And I'm glad you brought this up. So obviously there are circumstances that aren't going to fit the mold very well, right? Our mold is businesses that are up in our operation all 12 years that lost money and we can easily walk through that process. And there are a number of folks that are gonna fit right into that round peg, round hole works out very well, but we're also gonna have a lot of square pegs, right? So what I've encouraged folks to do is that if your situation is a little bit different, and I can I can attest to this because I've seen a couple of them, um, for example, on the lodging grant, since Joe's on, I'll plug this one. I've got a couple of folks who have reached out that have been at Put in Bay. Well, it doesn't make sense. They're not operating all year round. It does it, they can't operate all year round. So explain that to us, okay? So you know, you're required to attach documents. That doesn't mean that you can't include like a cover sheet with that, right? So if you're sending me like your revenue information and it shows very small amount in 19 or only revenue for a couple of months in 20 but not the entire year just explain to us why that's happening um you know we're always it's but more information is always better than less information um you know my favorite applications are the ones where they highlight the numbers i'm supposed to be looking for right because my eyes can quickly go to that i see it great make it as easy for us as you possibly can remember that there are actually you know human beings on the other side of this that are trying to review these applications and we're trying to make it work for you guys we really are um, but sometimes it's just it's just not there. So um, if there's a weird situation, if you don't fit the mold perfectly, explain that to us. Either reach out in advance and explain that to us, or submit your application and explain that to us as part of your attachments. That allows us to at least have a conversation about it internally, and then decide you know whether or not we think it it makes sense. Because again, we're trying to be as flexible as we possibly can. We want to get these funds out the door. That's our goal, obviously. So. Um, if we can make it work, if there are you know special circumstances that we can you know kind of um, see that we can make them work within the terms and conditions, we certainly will. Love that. Thank you so much. And um, Joe, feel free to jump in if you've got any questions coming up. I'm I'll I'll just keep going with some of the ones I'm seeing, and and feel free to include some more. We've got a couple questions related to eligibility. Um, we had one come in. Um, that they they are a vendor to a hotel, so they are literally someone whose business was shut down because they supply services to hotel guests. They're contracted by the lodging property. They provide services to hotel guests. Their business was shut down because the hotel was shut down. What are do they, do they have some options within this grant program, or what do you advise? Yeah, so they wouldn't qualify through the lodging grant program. You know, there's potential maybe through the food and beverage grant program, depending on what they do or the new business grant program. Um, it's something for us to keep in mind, obviously, again, you know, we're undersubscribed on these funds right now. We want to get the funds out the door. So in the future, the potential of us looking at these programs and maybe relaxing requirements a little bit. I don't know. That's not my decision to make. Um, that decision will be made above me and then I will be told to do that. So um, it's something that we'll keep in mind. Uh, it's definitely something that I'm now aware of. Uh, and actually, I've heard. I had an email come into the lodging grant inbox that was very similar, um, asking about their eligibility for a service provider to a hotel. So um, it's something for us to keep in mind. As of right now, the way the terms and conditions exist, no, unfortunately, that business is not eligible. But um, you know, we, it's it's something that we'll keep track of. Do you recommend that they shoot you an email or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Yeah, and, and honestly, you can do it either way. You can send an email, or if you just want to go ahead and submit the application and see if you're eligible, you can do that as well. We'll let you know either way. Okay, perfect. And again, there's no application deadline at this point. Um, someone had said, well, you know, when the, the county deadline's coming up, really, folks, what he's saying is there's money on the table, come and apply for it. So, um, you know, that, that there is no deadline right now. Um, and what I heard you say is you're going to kind of keep that rolling. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll just kind of continue to evaluate stuff. So, you know, obviously, what, Thursday will be a month since we opened the application. So, um, again, obviously, the goal is to get all this money out on the street as soon as we can. Uh, so we'll continue to evaluate things as we go along. And any updates or any changes that are made, obviously, will be communicated to our partners. So you folks will be able to push that out. And then uh, any changes will be up on the website as well. Perfect. And then there was another question very similar, said whether grants may be expanded if they're unused funds remaining. Like, they're... they're it, it's the same, it's kind of the same answer, right? Like yep. there's money, yeah. apply for it, even if it's past July 31st, yes. keep applying for these grants. Like the, the yep. July 31st was just kind of a, a cutoff date to make sure that all the counties have the ability to tap into these funds, but it doesn't mean that the, the 
applications aren't going to be accepted past that point. So keep them coming. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it was a volume protection. We had no idea what the volume was going to be on our applications for these programs. So it was just making sure that, you know, I have $200 million to the food and beverage grant program. If I had gotten $400 million in applications, we want to make sure that we're spreading the dollars around. So since that hasn't occurred, you know, we're not in that situation. Yeah. Right. Makes perfect sense. I also appreciate you mentioning that the multi-business issue, um, because when you have an uh, ownership, a company that has multiple properties, multiple businesses, um, that each of those separate businesses are eligible for these funds. So thank you uh, for clarifying that. A couple other questions we have. Um, so what about those organizations? And, and, and this is a question I had also when I saw it came up. You know, we have businesses that, that run events. Um, they may be uh, promotional events. There, there may be a nonprofit bringing entertainment. It may be organizations that are bringing in um, events. Their business model is as event producers who they then contract with the venues. Um, would they qualify under, under entertainment um, if they're the promoter and the coordinator of events? So I am okay with them being eligible as long as they can provide the required attachments to otherwise prove eligibility. I think that type of business, I don't have an issue with that type of business whatsoever. Um, it's an entertainment venue grant. Understand it's a venue, but these are people who utilize those venues. And if they can otherwise qualify, I don't see my staff, um, you know, really, you know, have batting a second eye at that, right? Um, because again, we're really focusing on those attachments. We ask you to tell us kind of what kind of business are you? We have a text box where we say, you know, what are you? Are you a restaurant, a bar, whatever you are? Um, but if it fits generally, again, the list on the website is not all inclusive. Uh, it was kind of our, our best guess of everything we could come up with at the time we were putting it together. So um, definitely open to, to considering alternatives that aren't specifically listed on that list. So a nonprofit that may have a concert or something as a fundraiser, but they weren't able to do any of those fundraisers, they could be eligible for this. Yep, I think so. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, that's great. Um, so the other thing I, I kind of had a question is like convention centers and meeting venues, right? So like, and I think, I think throughout this whole pandemic, what I've learned is that the terminology, right? like we as an industry have terminology, the state has terminology, every different sector has terminology. And sometimes right. people get hung up on, on the words in, in, instead of the meaning. And so, um, you know, a, a convention center or a meeting venue may not perceive themselves as being an entertainment venue, would they be eligible for this because they weren't able to conduct business um and just that so we can make sure yeah absolutely i think they're yes i think they are probably more directly eligible than the folks we just talked about because they actually yeah. are the venue so 100 okay. percent. yeah absolutely perfect great keep any questions coming um what are some of the most common reasons you've seen for applicants being denied um right now is there common mistakes people are making that might be helpful so honestly what it's funny because when we did the the grant program at the end of last year we had a ton of people that attached password protected documents and it's like okay um not sure what you want me to do with that but sure um we haven't actually had that problem this time honestly I, i'm surprised we put a note in the system but yeah you never think anybody's actually going to read the notes that we put in there to say don't update, uh, upload password protected documents yes. um you know honestly it's just it's and, and I won't ever fully understand it. I know that, you know, we encourage folks to, to read the terms and conditions and it's right there on the application as well. Just look at the attachments that we're asking for and make sure that the document you're submitting is one of the eligible types of documents that we're listing. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. Like, you know, I'll review an application and I'll get 95% of the way through it. And I'm like, great, this is a good application. I'm ready to approve it. And the last one, it's just like, I know you have the document that I'm looking for. This just isn't it, but I know you have it. So um that would be my thing honestly just double check your numbers make sure that the numbers that you're entering into the application on that second tab match the document that you're uploading um and then just make sure that the documents you're uploading are the type of document that we're looking for that's the biggest thing honestly again we're spending the majority of our time looking at those attachments so um that's the biggest thing just you know check yourself here's my document here's the terms and conditions say do they line up yes okay i'm good to submit if not you know try and find one of those documents that we do identify in the terms 
Perfect. Thank you. Joe, did you have any questions or uh, comments at this oh, point? That extensive list that um, you worked through covered really everything. The supplier ID, John, was one of the main aspects. And I think what you explained on that was really clear. So I appreciate that as well. Yeah, it's uh, again, it was just kind of one of those things where, you know, learn from your lessons, right? And it probably wouldn't be as bad if we did it again. We sent things out via paper check, but it was just a perfect storm of nobody was going anywhere. Everybody was shipping everything in the mail. And it was, uh, man, I, I think my budget folks would boycott me if I asked to told them again that we were going to send, you know, 12,500 paper checks. That, that would not go over well. So <laughs> my, my budget would have issues going forward. I can tell you that. That's, that's for certain. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I appreciate your comic candor. I love it. Um, and I think you can tell from this entire conversation, they, they want you to get this money. They want you yes. to be eligible. They want to provide help because the state has recognized the situation that many of the businesses are in. So um, I really encourage you to apply. Um, John and his crew is extremely respons responsive. Um, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to come on this webinar and of answer, you know, all, all of my questions before and after this webinar, really uh, appreciate your taking the time and explaining the process to us. And I hope it's, it's been helpful to all of you who have, have joined us again, we will make sure the recording is sent out and, um, if there aren't, uh, any, I'll do one last call for questions. Give it a hot second, but. Okay, seeing none, there's just a few saying, thank you very much for joining us, John. And uh, I appreciate you, Joe, thanks for uh, co-leading this and hope you guys have a great day. We will end the webinar now. Thank you. Thank you very much.